Well, good evening. Good to see you folks. Hope everything's going well with you and you had a good week. We look forward to a good weekend. And say a few words this evening. Uh, first of all, I want to make a very quick announcement. Uh, there's a movie coming out on February 23rd here in Denver in various theaters uh, entitled Is Genesis History? You can go on the website isgenesishistory.com and find out where the various locations are and so on. But there's only going to be one day, so that's on the 23rd, okay? So keep, keep that in mind. Okay, it's proud for me to uh, announce our speaker this evening, Terry Bay. Been with RMCF for a while. He's a writer, publisher, and a fossil ex excavator. Uh, Terry's been doing a lot of work with uh, Dr. Carl Baugh. Before we get into that, introducing the speaker, I'd like to say a word. <laughs> Stay here. Well, um, we thought this would be a good evening to uh, recognize our president, Dr. Ed Boudreau, who's before you here. Um, just wanted to uh, mention that he has been faithfully serving the Lord in Creation Fellowship for a great many years. He's, um, he's been a huge help to this, to this ministry here. And so um, he does a, a great many things for us. He um, writes the, the monthly uh, science president's corner for, for the uh, circular, and he gets all of our speakers. He's got all kinds of connections, and uh, he's really smart. He knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> so uh, we just wanted to recognize him. We have a, a plaque in recognition of his many years of service. So on behalf of the board of Creation Fellowship, Dr. Boudreau, I present you this plaque of recognition Thank of your you years of service. to be with this organization. Uh, when my wife and I came here in uh, August of 2005, because Hurricane Katrina wiped out our home down in New Orleans, um, I had no idea you know, what was going to happen. And eventually, down the line a few years, I was asked to be the president of this organization. I'm not going to ask you, tell you why, but I'm just going to say I was asked to be the president. And uh, I prayed about it, and of course, prayers were answered. God said, go ahead. So he's got me plugged in a lot of things in my old age. Uh, make matters kind of tough. Lost my wife last month, uh, 62 years together. And uh, it's tough, but uh, we'll get through it. God is good. And I know he's uh, always faithful. So I'm thankful that I got the Lord on my side. Thank you so much for this, guys of the board. And uh, I'm not going to say I don't deserve it or I do deserve it. I'm accepting it <laughs> in love, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, Terry is, uh, as I said, did excavations for Dr. Carl Barr, and uh, he's also done uh, other excavations as well for uh, the Field Museum uh, in Texas and the uh, FACT, uh, the Great Dinosaur Field Museum uh, in Montana. He's uh, uh, actually no uh, supporting many evidence for uh, findings in the dig 70% of the Tyrannosaurus Rex and recovering 60, 50 to 60% of a family in the Triceratops. 
So uh, Terry's got some interesting recoveries here. Uh, he's, of course, interested in dinosaurs as a youth, and it hung on, I guess, all the way through his life. And he's done great things. He wrote a great book, actually, which, I, which I'm sure speaks to the youth very well. He did a marvelous job in that book because I saw it when, uh, when he published it. And it, must, it, must, it was impressive. Um, we are uh, always fighting this issue of the age of fossils, uh, what, what fossils, how quickly they form, you know, and so on. And that's always an issue. And uh, what they represent, what time frame do they actually represent. So tonight we're going to hear from Terry, from Dino Bones, uh, or birds, nests. <laughs> uh, fossilization, does fossilization require millions of years? Uh, did you get that? Dino bones or bird's nest? You know the bird dino connection? Okay, all right. And uh, so, what, what does it, fo formation of fossils take millions of years? So, let's hear from Terry. Testing. Everybody hear me? Great. Thank you, Ed. And so sorry to hear about your wife. But uh, congratulations on your service here. You've been a blessing to all of us. And uh, pardon me if I drink a lot of water, but my throat is very dry naturally. And it gets drier when I speak. So I'll just put that there. And as Ed said, and I think most of you know, I uh, have uh, loved dinosaurs all my life. I've been collecting fossils and rocks. Uh, for most of my life and so you know I've heard all my life that it takes millions of years to create a fossil you've probably heard that too so that's what we're gonna look at tonight is that true Whoop. I don't know what happened okay is okay we skipped is there a uh... <laughs> A way to go back here? Okay. Well, anyway, we're going to begin with a def definition of the word fossil. So the word fossil means something dug up. And, you know, according to Merriam-Webster, uh, it came from the Latin word fossilis, obtained by digging. Now, fossils aren't always obtained by digging, but that's what the word means. So broadly speaking, a fossil is any evidence of past life. However, it depends how you define past life. A shell found on the beach is evidence of past life, but it's not a fossil, right? So this is a definition from the American Geological Institute from 1960. It says the fossil is the remains or traces of animals or plants which have been preserved by natural causes in the earth's crust. And if it just ended there, I, I, I'd like it. it would, I, could, I could go with that. But that's not the end. It's, uh, it goes on to say exclusive of organisms which have been buried since the beginning of historic time. So that begs the question, you know, what's historic time? National Geographic Society uh, says that uh, preserved remains become fossils if they reach an age of about 10,000 years. This is uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Their uh, web page, what is a fossil? A fossil can be as young as 10,000 years or as old as 3.5 billion years. This is uh, Northern State University, which is in South Dakota, in spite of its name. Uh, <laughs> and it says, a fossil is any physical evidence of life that occurred before the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000 years ago. You catching a theme? Here, 
This is a popular fossil site where they sell fossils. And uh, they put it this way, the convention is that fossils must predate record, rec recorded human history. Well, there is no defined date. Typically, something must be older than 10,000 years to be considered a fossil. And then down here, it says fossils are the remains of tra traces of ancient organisms. So, according to secular science, something has to be older than creationists say the Earth is to be a fossil, right? It has to be 10,000 years old or older. Most of us believe the Earth is only around 6,000 years old, give or take. So, there are two main types of fossils, trace fossils and body fossils. Trace fossils are mainly preserved evidence of behavior, such as footprints. This is the, uh, al the uh, dinosaur footprint site down at Picket, Picket Wire Canyon, down near La Junta, Colorado, and that's an allosaur footprint there. There's also sauropod footprints down there at Picket Wire Canyon. In fact, it's one of the largest dinosaur footprint sites in the world. It's, it's a good place to take a field trip sometime. You can uh, make arrangements with the uh, Park Service and uh, they'll take you on a tour there. It's something we could do if, if there was enough interest. Uh, this is some more footprints. These are uh, the slick rock dinosaur footprints that I've talked about here before that cross four layers of sediment here. But these are also uh, dinosaur tracks and they're trace fossils. Another type is tracks. These are trilobite tracks. And this is uh, a worm trail, tracks and trails. And then there's burrows and borings and this is devil's uh, corkscrew. Has anyone seen this before or heard of it? They really didn't know what this was to begin, you know, uh, when they first found it, but they uh, have since discovered that it's a, it's a fossil beaver burrow. And uh, it's located in uh, agate fossil beds in Nebraska. And borings are, uh, these are termite borings. Whoops. I don't know how to go back on this. There we go. Okay, these are termite borings in some petrified wood. And I have a couple examples of that here uh, from Kiowa, Colorado. Had a friend who has some property out there. And uh, he let, uh, let me go out there and pick up some petrified wood, and a lot of it has these termite borings in it. So that's a trace fossil, evidence of their activity. Uh, root cavities are another trace fossil, and these are uh, believed to be mangrove root cavities. And from Lyman, Colorado. In fact, if you've ever driven out Highway 83, have you seen that arch on the left-hand side? You ever seen the arch? Just before you get to I-70. Anyway, if you're out that way, there's an arch there, and that's, that's where this was found. A uh, guy in our church actually has a ranch out there, owns his property, and has taken us out there a couple times. And uh, that's where these uh, mangrove root cavities come from. An evolutionist would say uh, this was the uh, shoreline of the uh, Cretaceous Seaway, and that's why mangrove, you have evidence of mangroves growing there. Teeth marks are another trace fossil. 
This, uh, this is a hadrosaur toe bone, and uh, the woman holding it, uh, her name is Marge Beisch, and uh, she's a, uh, a terrific lady. Uh, she's, uh, last time I saw her, she was in her 70s, was still out collecting dinosaur bones, and uh, their ranch, the Beisch Ranch, is in Glendive, Montana, and they're very good friends of the folks that run the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum. So if you're ever up in Glendive, uh, you can actually go to the ranch and uh, visit, you know, this is Marge's uh, personal museum here, and she has all kinds of dinosaurs. She's, she knows more about dinosaurs than most paleontologists. In fact, uh, Jack Horner has acknowledged her in one of his books. But uh, terrific lady. Uh, teeth marks. These are uh, teeth marks of a mosasaur on an ammonite shell. So these are trace fossils as well. Gastroliths are trace fossils. You might think they're a body fossil, but they're trace fossils because they're evidence of. Uh, digestive activity. The sauropod dinosaurs swallowed these stones to help them digest their food. And they have a uh, unique luster to them. It's a pretty good picture of them, and, and I have some here. But they have a unique luster, waxy feel to them. And uh, it's from the digestive juices and the uh, friction with other uh, gastroliths and food, and they just have a, a unique feel to them. And then coprolites are uh, petrified dinosaur poop. And uh, you, you can guess what activity that uh, represents, but um, that's also a trace fossil. And then there are body fossils, and they include things like bones, teeth, petrified wood, as well as these kinds of things, which we'll, we'll talk more about some of these in a few minutes. And there are five basic types of fossil preservation. Molds uh, are imprints or a negative impression of an organism made in stone. So these are, uh, that's a shell on the left and an ammonite shell imprint on the right. And then along with molds go casts, and it's uh, the form of, of an organism created by the infilling of a cast by stone or, or minerals. So that is the, uh, the cast of that shell and this is, uh, might be a little hard to tell, but that's, that's a cast, part, part, partial cast anyway, <laughs> of, of an ammonite. And uh, this is another cast. Uh, this, this is uh, a, called a limb, uh, I, the word escapes me limb cast, I guess, um, but uh, it's the form of a branch that was left in the ground and then filled in by agate. And uh, uh, rock hounds and mineral collectors uh, enjoy this kind of stuff, and I do too. <laughs> and here's some molds and casts together. There's there's the uh, mold of a baculite and the cast, and this is the mold of the ammonite, and this part is the cast of it. And there's the uh, mold and cast of, of a shell. And these are from the Kremlin, Colorado ammonite site. Very interesting place. You can go visit it, and uh, you'll be all by yourself out there. And there's hundreds of these ammonites and molds and casts laying around out there. This is my son, and I just 
show that to embarrass him. He's, he's right there. <laughs> okay, carbonization is uh, when pressure and heat leave only a, a carbon film of a plant or animal. Preserved fossils are original tissues preserved by freezing, amber, or tar. So that's, you know, a mammoth. I think it's a baby mammoth that was frozen in Siberia or something and has been uh, recovered. Uh, the original tissue is still intact. There's a, a wasp in amber, so, you know, the, the original wasp is still there. This is a, a uh, Smilodon um, saber-toothed cat from the La Brea tar pit, and uh, those are real bones. However, original tissues that are thought to be prehistoric but aren't preserved like those last ones were or fully mineralized are called subfossils. Historic things, less than 10,000 years old, according to secular science, that are fossilized, they're not considered fossils at all. So I don't know if that makes sense, but all of the fossils found by the Denver Museum at Snowmass were unfossilized. They were unfossilized bones. Subfossils, even though they were assigned a date of 55,000 to 150,000 years. So you have original uh, bone and uh, tusks and, and all kinds of things, plant material from there. It's supposed to be this, this old and never fossilized or, or deteriorated. I think that's kind of hard to believe, personally. Um, this is the man who ran uh, the dig, and he is now, his name is Kurt Johnson. He's now the uh, curator of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And I think he got the job after this dig. But he's holding a, uh, a mastodon tooth there. That's a real mastodon tooth. It's not fossilized. That's a camel tooth. Just a real camel tooth. A bison skull. None of these things are fossilized. That's a log. And that's uh, from the same area. Some of you know that uh, Jim Strom and I uh, went to this place, and we actually picked up some of the, the wood that was up there, and it's wood. It's just, <laughs> it's just wood. You could put it in your fireplace. And so... Uh, if those are subfossils, what about the 65 plus million year old fossils that they're finding with soft tissues, like the T. Rex uh, that Mary Schweitzer found with all this soft tissue in it, uh, uh, blood vessels and even uh, blood cells and 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 uh, flexible tissue. These are uh, real bone cells from a Triceratops horn found up there in Glendive, Montana on the Baish Ranch. Mark Armitage uh, is doing that. And this is uh, a supposedly 80 million year old hadrosaur that still has real skin on it. So these things must be considered subfossils too, I guess. Another type of uh, fossilization is, is petrified or petrification. L lithification is another word for it. And uh, two types of, of this uh, type of petrification. One is permineralization. The other is replacement. So permineralization occurs when minerals like 
silica or agate fill spaces in original tissue. So the um, petrified wood, the logs up at uh, Petrified Forest in Arizona, a lot of them are uh, permineralized. This is a dinosaur skull from Dinosaur National Monument. Permineralized. This is a classic piece of permineral permineralized dinosaur bone. And you can see all the, the bone pores are filled in with uh, agate. And uh, when it's this, uh, this good, you know, uh, a piece like that could cost you $500, $1,000, $1, and, and some of them cost more than that. But uh, when it has the red agate and such good uh, red, uh, yeah, definition, and uh, they're very valuable at rock shops and mineral shows. Uh, I found a good uh, series of pictures on permineralization uh, at this uh, Worcester College geology blog. And uh, this is a piece of conifer wood that's been permineralized. You can see here uh, the rings. And uh, they gave me permission to use these pictures. But permineralization uh, preserves natural features in, in the original uh, tissue. In this case, it's wood. And, and wood actually has some amazing uh, preservation of uh, maybe uh, some of the best maybe you'll, you'll ever see, but this will show you. Uh, so it preserves the uh, rings. The rays are these things that run uh, vertically. This would be a ring here, and these rays are structures that run uh, across the ring. And then... Uh, even individual cells are, per, are mineralized. And uh, a lot of people use the word replaced, but I've learned that's not correct. However, <laughs> uh, this guy is a petrified wood expert named Walt Wright. And he says that even with this degree of mineralization, original wood tissue like cellulose lining the cell walls always remains present in the fossil wood. So replacement is the wrong term for that because it's not. There's original tissue in, in that kind of petrified wood that you saw. And even though it may be considered hundreds of millions of years old, like the petrified wood at uh, the petrified forest, which is in the Chin Li formation, which is over 200 million years old, supposedly. So that's permineralization. This replacement happens when minerals completely take the place of the original tissue. So this would, these would be examples of replacement. Completely replaced. There's not a lot of uh, original um, <coughs> structure, at least internally, left. This is more wood from Arizona, petrified wood. And you can see that it's some of the structures preserved, some of the, the rings, but all the rest of the detail is gone. So this is mostly replaced. And as you can tell, I mean, Arizona petrified wood is the best in the world. This is a, an ammonite that's been replaced by pyrite, and most of these come from Germany. I actually have one of these up here on the table. Very beautiful. So typically we're talking about permineralization or replacement when we refer to fossils. So how long does it take to make a fossil? This is uh, from the National Park Service. And uh, from the, the petrified forest, talking about how long it takes to make 
petrified wood. And uh, basically, they say minerals, including silica, dissolved from volcanic ash, absorbed into the porous wood over hundreds and thousands of years, crystallized within the cellular structure, replacing the organic material as it broke down over time. So hundreds and thousands of years, that's not too bad. This is, again, from the uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and this is uh, for preschoolers to kindergartners on their website, and they say fossils are usually formed in sediment that hardens over, the, over time with heat and pressure exerted on it. The original animals and plants are gradually replaced by minerals that seep in over huge amounts of time. So they're kind of general. This is from the Smithsonian and uh, their, their education uh, website, how, how Dinosaur Remains Become Fossils, and they say over millions of years water passing through the accumulating sediments affects the dinosaur bones. This is the American Museum of Natural History, and they say over millions of years water in nearby rocks surrounds these hard parts, and minerals in the water replace them bit by bit. This is a, a popular website, uh, Fossil Facts and Finds. Oop. And again, over the course of millions of years, they dissolve away the outer shell. This is an educational website for, I believe it was uh, seventh graders, and they show you know, how a fossil is made over millions of years, the sediments become rock, the crocodile becomes a fossil. And this is an article from uh, Live Science, which is a pretty popular website. And uh, how long does it take to make petrified wood? In nature, petrified wood forms over millions of years. Over millions of years, these minerals crystallize within the wood, the wood cellular structure forming the stone-like matter known as petrified wood. And uh, that was just in, in 2012, fairly recently. However, scientists know better. They all know better. This is another article from uh, Live Science. And this is about petrified wood uh, that was created in a lab. And it says, achieving what would take millions of years in only a few days, scientists have drastically sped up the process of petrifying wood. The lab process is pretty much the same as petrification in nature. It says, once the samples were clean and cut, they were soaked in hydrochloric acid for two days then soaked in silica solution for another two days. After the wood, had been air dried, the pieces were placed into a furnace filled with argon gas and steadily heated to 1400 degrees Celsius, where the samples baked for two hours. So basically five days, in five days, they were able to create petrified wood. And uh, so it, it's a few days, and the date on this is January 2005. So it's been over 10 years just since this article's been around. Now, uh, in doing research on this, I found a lot of interesting uh, examples of things that have been petrified in, in a, a pretty short time, in historic time, of course. So they're not fossils, you, you see. But uh, this is petrified bog butter from uh, Northern Ireland, I guess, you know, back in the Middle Ages, they would, they would put things like butter, and it is in, in a wood box here, in, in a bog to preserve it. But uh, somebody forgot about this one, and uh, they found it, you know, in, in recent years, and um, uh, the author here uh, actually saw it and asked the guy, 
if it really was, he asked one of the curators, tell me more about it, quizzed him on whether the rocky contents of the wooden box were in fact fossilized butter. He was adamant that this was the case. This is from an article in uh, Creation magazine. So it dates to the Middle Ages, so it's roughly 600 to 1600 years old. Didn't take millions of years to fossilize. This is uh, from an article by uh, John Morris in uh, ICR's Acts and Facts from 2001 about a fence post that is fossilized. Uh, analysis showed that it was definitely petrified wood, had a nail imprint and marks of a strand of barbed wire. I don't know if you can see that on there, but um, it was confirmed to be petrified wood. Found along an old fence line dating probably from the late 1800s in central Washington, dominated by a thick blanket of volcanic ash. So that's, that's from 2001. So that would uh, make it just, you know, a little over 100 years old. This is a petrified bowler hat. <laughs> and there's another picture of it. This is from New, Ze New Zealand. And uh, in 1886, a volcano called Mount Tarawera erupted, burying a small town known today as the Buried Village. Artifacts entombed in the ash for about 60 years are displayed in a small museum, including a fossilized bowler, uh, bowler hat, a petrified ham hock, <laughs> and a petrified bag of flour. Not a very good picture, but uh, they would have been mineralized by the silica in the volcanic ash. And, and again, these only about 60 years it took. Here's another petrified bag of flour from the United States. This is uh, from an, an old water wheel mill at Eureka Springs Gardens in Arkansas, operated between 1840s and 1903. Uh, flour was still present, but all the airspace had been filled with tiny calcium carbonate crystals. That's per mineralization. And that's another article from uh, Creation Magazine. But that again is, is 60 years, just 60 years. Here's a petrified miner's hat. And uh, this was from uh, Richard Stepanek uh, of Alpha Omega Institute uh, from 2011. And uh, he reports on a, a miner's hat that was found in a mine in Australia. Felt hat fossilized by calcium carbonate rich water in about 50 years. This uh, is a uh, picture I took at the Denver Gem and Mineral Show in 2009 when uh, the theme of the show was fossils. So if you're, if you're interested in fossils, you want to go to a show like that because uh, they, they bring out a lot of interesting things. And uh, they don't have that theme very often, so I was fortunate. But here's, uh, there was a display case with a petrified board from a Colorado mine. And uh, the label indicates that it, it was mineralized in less than 20 years. It says the earliest mine was 1859. And the label dates from the 1870s. So it was less than 20 years old. And that was the original label there. And, and that's just uh, making it clear what it said. But uh, 20 years. Here's a petrified teddy bear. And uh, this is... Uh, from Creation Magazine again, a guy named Monty White in 2002 wrote that he was surprised to uh, read about small teddy bears being placed under a waterfall in Yorkshire that turned to stone in three to five months. The mineral calcite, calcium carbonate, is deposited along with small amounts of other minerals. Gradually, they build up and coat the object with a crust of rock. So 
the mineralization on this teddy bear might only be a, a thin layer, but I, I, would, I would think that if it stayed there longer, it would probably uh, replace the whole thing. But that only took three to five months. And you may have seen this teddy bear before, if any of you are familiar with uh, Creation Truth Ministries in Canada, and Vance Nelson uh, used, to, whoops, used to sell these. And uh, so uh, teddy bear and it rose. These petrified ob objects took about two weeks to complete. Natural hot spring water with extremely high mineral content was used to spray these items. The red-orange coloring is due to the high, high iron content of the water. It says the roses are covered in, in, in a aragonite layer, so it's just covered, but the petrified teddy bears are partly permineralized. So they used to sell these, and I don't think they sell them anymore. I wish I would have bought one when they, when they were selling them. I think you can still buy the roses, though, from them. This is another uh, example from the Denver uh, Mineral Show of 2009. This is uh, girthite, which is a form of iron, after snake skin. So I don't know how long snake skin takes to break down and decompose, but it's not very long, right? And, and as you can see, the snake skin has been replaced by Girthite. And also at the same mineral show, they had this bird's nest. It says uh, calcite pseudomorph after bird's nest. And this uh, is from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. But I uh, want to explain what a pseudomorph is. A, in mineralogy, a pseudomorph is a mineral that has retained its original crystal form while being replaced by another mineral. So here's a cuprite crystal from the Congo, and that's what it normally looks like. And this is uh, a cuprite uh, that has uh, been changed by the mineral malachite. So it's a malachite pseudomorph after cuprite. So with the uh, bird's nest, uh, percolating water mist from a hot spring in Arizona permineralized the bird's nest with calcite. And again, I don't know exactly how long that took, but I imagine not very long. And it just fascinates me that something like that could be fossilized, you know, and I... I found another example of, of a bird's nest with eggs, uh, and this one's in a museum in Bern, Switzerland. There was actually another one from South Africa, but uh, uh, it was copyrighted, they, and they you know, it wouldn't let you use the picture. But I, I find these very interesting. So, does it take millions of years to make a fossil? No, absolutely not. Fossilization is not a product of time, but of the right physical and chemical conditions. Under the right conditions, it can happen in a matter of days, not to mention weeks, months, or years. In fact, the mineralization of organic matter requires a rapid process, not millions of years or even many years. It, it has to happen quickly before the organic tissues completely decompose. Back to uh, Walt Wright, uh, according to him, uh, and he's not a creationist, I'm sure he's an evolutionist, this kind of permineralization that you see, especially in petrified wood, where you get all that minute detail and down to the cellul cellular level, he says it has to happen within two years. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the tissue breaks down and you wouldn't get that kind of uh, 
you know, uh, uh, features in the wood. It wouldn't be preserved. And uh, he also talks about the rate that uh, uh, chemicals or uh, like silica moving into the wood, it has to happen quickly as well. And I can't explain that very well. But uh, I was very surprised to hear him say that because uh, I know he's not a creationist, and I thought, wow, that's, that's great evidence. So what conditions are required to make a fossil? Rapid burial, which inhibits tissue deterioration, preserves it long enough to be mineralized. You need sediments containing minerals like silica, quartz, calcite, iron. These are some of the most common uh, minerals in the earth. And so they are commonly the, the most common minerals you find in, in fossils. There are uh, lots of others, but... Volcanism helps. It provides silica and heat, which speeds up the mineral, mineral precipitation. An abundance of water required for minerals to precipitate into, uh, into solution and permeate organic tissues. So, what could possibly uh, <laughs> meet those conditions that, that we know of? Of course, uh, the, the worldwide flood of Noah had all these conditions. It was the perfect uh, creator of, uh, for fossils, and I believe that most fossils are, came from Noah's flood. So, I have a different def definition of uh, fossilization, and uh, I, uh, my definition is fossils result from the right physical and chemical conditions, not long ages of time. Most fossils are the result of geochemical conditions created during and after the worldwide flood of Noah less than 4,500 years ago, and were likely formed within a few years of their burial. And that's my presentation. Do we have a mic? There we there go. We go. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's give Terry a hand. This is really an interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's what all of us believe, I think, basically. Yeah. But to see all of this information coming out that supports that, that's another thing. And so I think that's very good that you gave this tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, questions? open for questions. Now please come up to the mic. If you will. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my question is, is that uh, you mentioned the petrified wood. What type of radioactive um, have they done uh, tests on that, like uh, carbon-14 or mm -hmm. other radioactive methods, what type of data are they coming up with? Yeah, uh, there has been carbon-14 testing of wood as well as dinosaur bones and mm -hmm. other things. The, uh, the dates they generally come up with are like 23,000 to 39,000 years. Those, those are the carbon-14 dates. But they believe that uh, those dates are skewed partly by Noah's flood, which um, put a lot of carbon, you know, into, well, into, into the flood waters and may have, you know, influenced the, the ages they get from fossilized things. But the fact that you can get carbon-14 dates from 
dinosaur bones, which are supposed to be 65 million years plus, uh, shows that they can't be that old because carbon-14 carbon can only test up to about 50,000 years. Yes. It's only accurate to about that. They say maybe 100,000 at the most. So they're finding carbon-14 in dinosaur bones all the time, and as well as uh, petrified wood. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to see more experiments like that. Second question, yeah. if you let me. Um, in your definitions, uh, that there are qualified definitions, about mm -hmm. 10,000 years to, uh, I, I forget, uh, for fossils, but if there are dino fossils, it seems like the the dating scheme is really skewed, and they don't. They one one says ten thousand years, and you've got uh, millions of years. Yeah, and uh, you know. Does anybody really know what they're talking about? You know, I I, I, I really enjoyed and understand the presentation, but it, it, in your presentation, it just seemed like no one's talking uh, about the dates that they're coming up with. I mean, at least what you presented there. I say there's confusion here. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't. You don't see much of this kind of information. Yes. In the uh, public. Uh, Spear, do you? I mean, I had never seen most of this mm -hmm. before. Um, they're not going to popularize these kind of findings because they contradict, you know, evolutionary yeah. science. And uh, but I think you know they have problems with dating, like with those bones from snow mats. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they they actually ate some of the leaves and and uh, plant material they mm -hmm. found. It was that fresh, and uh, but they had to assign older dates, even though they know that those those were much more recent than mm -hmm. fifty thousand, hundred fifty thousand years. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I enjoyed the pictures of the gastroliths that you showed. How do they know that they were actually inside of another animal? Were they found like in the belly area of another fossil or something? That's a good question. You'd think that would be the case, but actually very few gastroliths are found with dinosaur bones. Um, they, do, they have found some, you know, in the rib cage area of, of dinosaurs, but usually they're found independently of, of any bones. Um, and there's controversy about them, you know, uh, just for that reason. You know, they, some people doubt that, you know, people that call gastroliths are really gastroliths. And, uh, but uh, I, I have found a lot of gastroliths. <laughs> and they, they have a unique uh, feel to them, as well as a look. They, they have a unique uh, waxy, I call it a waxy uh, smoothness um, that is unlike any other rock. And so that's one of the, the clues for me when I find a gastrolith. You know, I look for that waxy feel and they have a luster that's kind of unique as well. Um, and the, uh, the surface Polishing is kind of unique. It's different from a, a river rock. Um, it's usually the high surfaces are very polished and the lower surfaces are not. But um, like I say, there is controversy about them. Some people don't think they're really, you know, unless you find them with a dinosaur bones, they're not gastroliths. You can't prove it. But I'm very confident that uh, these stones that I have up here are gastroliths. And you can come up and feel them. And uh, in fact, um, the, uh, the items here on, on this side of the table are for the taking. There are gastroliths here. 
Um, and you can feel uh, the waxy uh, luster of them. There are uh, pieces of dinosaur bone here. And these are uh, pieces of petrified wood from Douglas County. I live in Douglas County and I go out all the time looking for petrified wood. And there's a lot of it there, mainly because, you know, uh, there's a lot of rhyolite in Douglas County. And rhyolite ha is made up of 75% silica. So that produces the silica that uh, mineralizes petrified wood. So there's a lot of wood in uh, Douglas County. So these things are free. Uh, if you'd like to take them home, uh, feel free to do that. And on this side of the table are examples of most of the things that that uh, I showed tonight. I don't have any preserved fossils, no mammoth or uh, anything like, I don't have any amber. Those amber uh, specimens like that are also very expensive. <laughs> but uh, I have most of the other types up here. So uh, if there aren't any more questions, oh yes sir, go ahead. I had a grad student come to our door to take and do some fundraising for PBS and I started talking to him a little bit and he's, he said he started out in engineering but he wanted to go in, into biology, chemistry type stuff. And he came up and he started talking about how you can find, determine a lot of detail about the cells in a fossil. Mm -hmm. Now I don't quite understand the process. How fine a detail can you do with that? And then he was leading to the fact saying, well, these professors say that you can take and figure out how some of these cells have changed over time. And then, you know, changed in the, more in the chemical level. And I'm sitting there, how can you do that when the cells are supposedly replaced by minerals? Well, I don't, I've never heard that before. I tend, I tend to doubt it, but um, usually, I've never seen that kind of detail with, with a bone. I've only seen it with wood and some of these wood pieces I have here, which I also found in Douglas County, have that kind of detail down to the cellular level. But with bones, it's usually the pores that are filled in and mineralized and you don't get the cellular level type mineralization. So I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with bones like that, but um, you could trace wood, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say development, but different types of wood based on their cellular structure that, you know, is supposed to be two or three hundred million years old. But as we know, it's not. It's, <laughs> it's just uh, within four thousand years or so. Yes, ma'am. Hi, great tonight. Thank you. I'm just so curious, the lower left picture, what is that? Uh, that is, that's called a heteromorph ammonite. And it's a rare form of ammonite, that, that curl. And uh, those are also, I, I had one at home and I, I, I should have brought it. I have a little one. <laughs> Uh, but it's an ammonite. It's a species of ammonite, very pretty rare, unusual, and expensive. Again, that's an expensive ammonite to, to buy. Um, so I, I was fortunate to buy one about this big for $25 from a Moroccan dealer. <laughs> and uh, Moroccans, are, they're, uh, they're pretty good about... Uh, you know, bargaining with you and, and they often give you good deals. So that's another reason I go to the Denver Gem and Mineral Show. Yeah. You're talking about minerals or um, fossilization, they believe it takes millions of years. What about soft body creatures like bacteria, um, jellyfish, or even the, um, the gills of fish, which usually deteriorate within a matter of hours, yeah. minutes? Uh, those are all problems for evolution. 
you know, soft-bodied creatures like jellyfish found in, you know, uh, Cambrian rocks. Um, it had to happen very quickly, and there had to be unique uh, circumstances for that to happen, but they find quite a few of them. Um, according to evolution, that it shouldn't happen because it takes so long to build up sediment. According to evolution, I believe the rate is something like th a quarter of an inch per thousand years, or three quarters of an inch per thousand years. And, it, it, you know, uh, a uh, jellyfish is not going to wait around that long to be, to be uh, fossilized. So it had to happen fast. It had to be a scenario like the flood of Noah where it was killed, you know, it, it laid on sediment, then it was covered quickly by another layer of sediment, and, and it was preserved, or its, uh, its outline at least was preserved. It had to happen quickly. Yeah. Um, for the gastroliths? Yeah. Have they ever been found, like, in the coprolite or? In coprolite? Or, or coprolite or inside the uh, That's a good question. Um, I, to my knowledge, they've never been found in coprolite, but I personally have found gastroliths near coprolite, you know, which has made me wonder whether, you know, sometimes they expelled uh, gastroliths uh, with their excrement, you know. But I have found uh, gastroliths in the same vicinity as, as uh, coprolite. In fact, in the same vicinity as these coprolites here, which are from western Colorado. Could ask one more question on the, do you know on the rapid fossilization that was done by the laboratory that took five days? The, yeah. With the, so when it's mineralized, is it completely replaced by the silica? So is it all silica when it's done or is there's? Uh, from, from what I read, uh, yeah, I believe it is. And uh, they're, they're, I believe they're even using it, have some industrial uses for it these days, so I imagine maybe there's some companies out there making this stuff and, and they're using it for, you know, flooring or uh, I don't know, whatever, but uh, thanks. Sure. Okay. Um, when you come up to look at the fossils or whatever, I just remind you, the refreshments downstairs, we have to pick up everything by 9.30 tonight, so uh, don't get down there too late, okay? And our speaker next month is Ludy Graves, another local yokel, and uh, he will present us an interesting presentation as well. I see Bill coming up. I just want to remind you that we need to be out of the fellowship hall by 9.30. And so we're going to start putting the chairs back up on the tables at 9.15 tonight. Please help me with that. Also, if you're going on the museum tour, please try to be there 15 minutes early so we can get organized. That would be at uh, 9.45 at the museum tomorrow morning. Thank you. And thank you, Terry. You're welcome. And like I said, feel free to come up, take uh, these fossils on this side and these side. Uh, on this side are, are for looking at and be happy to answer any more questions you may have.